just to help you think about opportunities and, and how to look for jobs, um, whether it's academia or the private sector, I'll give you some tips that way too. Um, and again, the last part is just this whole idea of connecting with people, whatever that happens to be. Um, you know, it could be sometime in 2021, it could be a little bit later, but we really are working through it all together. All right. Um, with that said, I'm going to jump into the shifting landscape. So I know that all of you are, are in grad school and, and, and doing programs, whether it's master's level work or um, or PhD level work. I, I get it. You know, I, I understand where, you know, where we're all coming from and, and how that's working just because um, I finished undergrad in 2003, right after that, that dot com burst, you know, and then I finished um, grad school in 07, 08. And that's when, you know, we had another recession. And then right now, I'm recruiting for a gigantic platform LinkedIn when we're dealing with the COVID recession. So um, keep everything in mind. I, I think that I'll try to give you a good example of, of both sides of the house when it comes to in-person recruiting or, or just online recruiting as well. All right. Um, a couple of things to think about here. The reality, th this downturn, it might last a while, right? I know a lot of the tech companies in the Bay Area and, and around the country and um, universities as well, too don't know when we're going to be back in the office. We don't know what it's going to mean for our recruiting issues. And, you know, if, if you just look at the plain stats, it can be a little bit scary. So, you know, I hope I can give you some tips that will make your, your search better, make your ability to network and connect with each other a little bit better. Um, you know, I, I will say at LinkedIn, you know, we're probably not going to go back to the office um, until probably next summer. Um, and then at that same point in time, a thing to think for all of you to think about as you get jobs again in academia or the private sector, some places will allow remote options. Some places will want you to be back on campus. It really does depend, but um, there are some tailwind effects that are going to affect us here. So um, just hang in there. Just try the best you can. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself and, and we'll figure it out. Um, adding to that, you know, what's going on right now is, is that people seem to really want to connect and network. You know, there are a lot of people that, that are sharing who they are. And the theme that I'm going to talk about a lot today is that, you know, be open with who you are as a person. Like, don't be afraid to share. Like, I think right now there are so many people that are looking for that connection that it's a good thing. As much as you're comfortable sharing about yourself and, and investing yourself in others, the better it is. Um, but at the same time, like when hiring moves up, just, just be ready. Be on the occasion. I'll give you a few links here in a moment to show you where you can find some of them. But Again, I think the biggest thing, I know that when, when you're working in STEM, when you're in graduate school, there's always this idea of, of you know, forming, forming a hypothesis and figuring it out and changing as you go. Like, that's what science is, right? The same thing is right now. We have to be able to adapt to this new normal. Some of it's going to be online. Some of it's going to be our in-person interaction. We just don't know. So just mentally prepare yourself. I always tell people, um, be ready so you don't have to get ready. And I think that's kind of where you have to be right now upskill as much as you can, get as many skills as you as you possibly can, and then just build that network and get people on your side and help people get to know you. And, and that's really the best way to start. Um, first part is I'm just gonna talk about networking remotely today. Um, okay, networking is a long game, right? It's, it's not simply just you find one person, um, they give you a referral, you get that first job in. Um, the fact of the matter is that there are more people than there are openings. Um, there are, you know, there's a big funnel until you get to where you want to go. So just understand that it's, it's not always going to come quick and that everyone's going to feel the same way you are, right? Like there, there's talk about imposter syndrome. There's talk about, do I want to feel authentic? We get it, right? But the chances are just, you're going to have to open yourself up and, and it's okay to be vulnerable um, to more than just one person. Like you're going to have to really find that network, that village, um, you know, that multiple set of people that'll help you get to your goal. And obviously know what your goals are and, and start early. As a recruiter at LinkedIn, what I always tell people is that you want to help me help you, right? So just really be aware of your ask. Like, um, you know, if, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking for an internship, if you're looking for um, a research opportunity, just pre be really clear and know what you want to get into before, um, before you, you dig in too deep. Okay. Why are we doing this today, right? Like, I, I really want to stress like the importance of, of making you all visible. Like, your skill set is going to be extremely important in this new economy, right? It's all going to be about information, about the sciences, really about what STEM has to offer. Like, companies, 
obviously will love your soft skills, which I, I will try to give you some glimpses of, but I, I think the more people see what you're capable of, the better. Um, I think also access too, right? Like I think the more people you connect with, the more people can open those right doors for you. Um, and then I'll try to give you some tips and tricks today on how to like stand out, um, especially while we can't stand out in person or at career fairs, um, you know, where you stand in those little circles and, and wait for recruiters to talk to you. Um, I think this will make some sense to you. I, I think the first thing is, is really defining your approach. Um, Pretend it's research, right? You're, you're going to have your hypothesis. You're going to discover some, some facts. Then you're going to define like your key insights, the themes, opportunities that you're really looking for. And then you're just going to develop your ideas, right? You look at your, your kind of your minimum value proposition or your minimum viable product and just say, okay, if I can just do this much, it'll move the needle this much. Same with finding a job, right? Like if you just want to get your foot in the door at a company, if you want to connect with, um, you know, an alumnus or an alumna of of the college that you've gone to undergrad or for grad school, like these are little iterations that you're gonna build, right? Like it's not gonna just be one gigantic gate opening that you can figure out. So really just define and decide what step you wanna do along the way. I just wanted to, to make it seem like it's research so you understand that it is an iterative process to like network and connect with people. Um, another thing that I like is that, you know, practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, right? So if it's your elevator pitch, you know, like formulate that paragraph of what you're gonna say, like understand how you're gonna talk about your one minute spiel and who you are, um, practice that. If you're gonna have video interviews, get in front of your, your computer screen um, and, and try out what an interview looks like, like play with your lighting, see what you're gonna wear. Like, I, I really believe in that. But anyways, um, just approach it like you would a research project, like any other hypothesis in, in your work. And, and that's really um, the way to go there. Um, yes, I work at LinkedIn, but I'm not going to exclusively talk about it. But I, I do think it's going to be a really valuable tool for all of you. And, and I can give you some some really important insight on, on how to best do your LinkedIn profile. Um, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you know, you can get my information from, from Jill. And she can send you my way and I can help you get started. But I'm just going to assume that that most of you at least have a baseline profile. And I'll give you some really quick basic shout outs to stand out and how to really network. All right. Okay. First thing is if you pull your profile up, um, you're going to have like your background photo. You're going to have your name and you're going to have who you are. To really help people understand who you are and, and to really network and get in the door, that little box of outline right there will oftentimes say, you know, um, graduate student at so-and-so place or just plain recruiter at LinkedIn. Your headline is really a great way to show who you are and to let people understand where you're coming from when you send them a message, when you interact with them um, on, on the platform. Um, if you look me up on LinkedIn, you know, normally it would just say like, you know, talent acquisition engagement manager or senior recruiter at LinkedIn. But for me, I changed my headline to say recruiter advisor consultant. Um, cause that's kind of what I think of myself as, right? Like I'm a recruiter in that I go out there and I help people get jobs. I'm an, an advisor because I give a lot of advice for career search, um, and young professionals on how to get that first job in consultant. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of admissions consulting for universities and for people. And so I think this is a super easy way to know who I am. So I think for all of you out there that are going to be looking for jobs someday, um, put a couple, put a couple lines on who you are. But also, quick tip, don't put, quote unquote, seeking opportunities. Like, I think what's really great is if you want to be a data scientist and you're just studying data science right now or AI or machine learning, it's okay to put like aspiring data scientists or a aspiring machine learning engineer. Like, that's probably a good step. Um, I wouldn't leave it to like open for opportunities or, or what it is. Again, it's a great way to brand yourself. Super easy thing to do. Um, a couple other quick tips not just on LinkedIn, but like on any social media platform or, or any other platform or webinar that you do, don't be afraid to add pictures or videos or presentations. Um, you know, I know it's probably pretty tough to like want to keep your camera on all the time. And I'm not saying do it right now, like do whatever you're comfortable with, but just as an example of the time that we're in right now, if, for example, if your profile picture is up on LinkedIn, 
you're 22 times more likely to get engaged with on the platform because we know you're a real person. Like we, we know there's another person on that other side of the screen. So um, again, that's just a way to be present, um, super simple thing to do. And in connecting with people, add, add your skills and add what you're good at. You have a lot to give other people, um, especially with your background. I think the more people know about your skill set, the better it's going to be for people to say, hey, I really want to learn from you or hey, you can really learn from me. All right. Um, ways to find some opportunities online. Today was a really big first step for everybody here, right? You you raised your hand to join this what, this webinar. You know, there's going to be some tactical tips that I've given you. Um, but it's also a chance just to like reflect and, and bounce ideas off of other people. Um, again, Eventbrite is a great is an interesting resource that I never really thought about. Um, obviously, LinkedIn where I work. Um, there's tons of Facebook groups out there. You can go on Meetup.com, um, but just anything to get started, right? Like we're talking about building community, like, and it's just one at a time. So um, what you're doing today, I think we've got about 30 people on it is, is a really good first step, but continue these things. Um, while we're on the subject of, of school programs, I think a really interesting thing is just to how, how to really get started finding people. Um, that third bullet point, you know, where you see, I, I talk about finding people on, on social network, on, on LinkedIn, um, I would say try to find people that you have something in common with, but uh, a really easy way to connect. Uh, most people on our platform have under 500 connections. Um, I, I would probably say that it's probably something like 90% like of LinkedIn users have less than, than 500 connections. So it's okay to start small. You know, it, it, again, it, it could be people that you've gone to school with, it could be people that you've gone to work with, but I really would just actually just try to start kind of trying to connect with people and remind them of who you are right now. That way, when you think ahead to when you actually need somebody, it's not transactional. Um, so just remember, I'm going to say it a couple of times today, but networking is a long game um, and really provide people with some benefits of like where you go back together with. Um, and, and it's personalized, right? So Within LinkedIn, you can do this, but this really goes for connecting with people on, on Glassdoor, connecting with people on, on Handshake, connecting with people through your alumni portal. Um, one little line can go a long ways. So I know I'm kind of preaching in the choir because I work at LinkedIn and a lot of people send me connection requests, but it's always really helpful just to say, hey, this is where I met you um, and this is why I want to stay connected. Uh, a simple ask that goes a long way. I mean, there are people way more influential and way more popular on the platform than I am, um, and they just get so many requests, they can't respond to them all. So the easier you make it for them to say, hey, I remember Sean, or I remember Aura, or I remember um, Elizabeth, the better it's going to be um, for them to connect and, and easier for you, all right? An important part of networking is, is really like asking for help and sharing your story. I think a lot of times as students, we, we get so wrapped up in our own world that we think I can just do it alone, right? I'm going to work on this project. I'm just going to do my papers. I'm going to do my homework. But really, like, I think the key is like, once you're open to asking for help, that's the really big thing. Throughout the course of my career, whether it's been MBA admissions or corporate recruiting, um, a couple of big points on, on networking. You really should assume and act with positive intent. Um, I know networking can be hard. I know it's hard to, to put yourself out there, but I would say, you know, act as if people are good, act as if people want to help you and, and really try to assume the same thing for yourself. Like try to help as many people as possible. You know, there's that idea of a rising tide lifts all boats. I cannot stress enough. That's the whole point of networking and connecting with people. Um, and, you know, some people say treat networking like you're trying to make friends. Professional networking doesn't have to go quite that far, but what I mean by that is that don't make it transactional. Don't only reach out when you want a referral for a job. Don't only reach out when you see an opening on their team. You know, if you see an interesting news article, just be like, hey, son, did you see this interesting article about um, being black at work at LinkedIn? Or did you see this interesting article on how university admissions um, is being affected by California law. Like just any of those things would be, would be cool and interesting. Like don't be afraid to share those things. Um, another interesting note that I come across all the time, and, and you all may already get this, um, but I've talked to a lot of students that have expressed some regret. They spent so much time trying to build strong relationships with professors and with administrators that they don't spend enough time interacting and connecting with each other, your fellow students. So. 
if, if you think it's already unset, I will say it again, like, don't forget to connect with your fellow students across the different programs. Like those are the people that are going to understand what you went through um, and, and really be able to draw upon a shared experience. And again, I mentioned it earlier, keeping in touch with people over time is just a really important skill to kind of develop. Doesn't have to be major, it could be any little thing. Um, I'm gonna show you an example right here in, in terms of like sending meaningful notes and, and emails. This could translate to a phone call as well. Um, I mentioned earlier finding common ground, but I think getting to the point and keeping it short and sweet is the best way to go. I know that sometimes when you're in academia, you think you tend to think, more is more. I tend to think less is more just because people are reading so much these days that it's a lot easier on your life to keep it short and sweet. <clears throat> if there's something I want to leave you with, it's this idea of, of KISS. I say it to my wife all the time. Her name is Sherry. KISS stands for keep it simple, Sherry. Or if it's easier for you to think about, think about me. Keep it simple, son. Um, that's the best way to approach um, interacting, asking for help, or, or creating connections. Um, you know, like, Show them who you are and, and what you need and get straight to the ask. That's, that's all we really need. Um, obviously, and, and tell them what you want. I think a, a good point about writing is, is you've probably heard, um, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So if you think about it that way and keeping it short and sweet, that's a pretty good formula for connecting with people through notes and emails. Um, things to watch out for. This may seem really basic, but I'm talking about misspellings, grammatical mistakes, or even how you pronounce somebody's name um, is really important. There was a really a, an interesting tool that we just put on LinkedIn the other day. Um, if you're on the profile, you can actually look next to somebody's name and there's like a little uh, a little speaker where you can click on that button and they, and they will tell you how to pronounce that person's name. So if you've got a really difficult name or a name you don't know how to pronounce, um, it'll give you a chance to record in your own voice how to raise, um, how, how to, you know, approach somebody's name. So again, that's a super interesting thing. Like details matter, right? Like you don't always get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, not so that you can't come back from that, but I think the easier it make for somebody that like the cleaner your, your approach is and the, the better your details are, it's going to be, um, super, super helpful, especially during this time where everyone is really trying to connect and engage like on different platforms and, and not in person, you're not going to have that chance to walk up to somebody and say, Hey, this is who I am. So I think your written communication and your, your, your online communication are, are about as more important now than, than maybe ever before. Um, and then the ask, don't be afraid to make the ask of what you want. Um, and an example as a recruiter here, um, and I, I think a lot of you students in graduate school right now have your different areas of expertise and you if you're super specialized you may know where you're going but even at that point in time you might need a little bit of help think about your audience and what i mean by this is me as a linkedin recruiter if someone messages me out of the blue or emails me out of the blue and they say hey son this is my resume this is my background please find a job or role for me that's not going to work right like Understand what you're trying to get. It's much better if you reach out to me and say, hey, son, um, I see your recruiter at LinkedIn. I see that you're recruiting for sales trainees. Um, you know, my background is in communications and anthropology, but I've always loved sales. Do you think you can talk to me more about that sales internship? That's what we're looking for, right? Or they'll say, hey, son, we just saw that you're in charge of artificial intelligence and machine learning intern recruiting. Um, that's an area that really speaks to me. I've been able to do three or four uh, machine learning projects while in graduate school. Um, do you think you can introduce me to the person who's recruiting for this position? That's what we're talking about, okay? Um, and, and certainly don't email someone and say, hey, can I ask you a question? Like, because that goes back and forth, all right? So that's another big point of no-no. Like, if, if you're going to ask them a question, just ask it in the ask. Uh, maintaining the relationship, I think these are a couple of things that I talked about before, but I, I still think are just some important bullet points to think about. Um, the objective, again, just, just, I wanted to repeat this point when it talks about networking or connecting. People are busy. Always remind people of where you know them from and always be considerate of other people's time. Um, if you can give them some availability at the beginning, um, that's always a great start. So let's say you take my advice and I, and and you reach out to Jill and you want to talk to her, not just about, you know, what's going on with your program, but also how she got where she did today. I mean, you know, 
Jill's got a PhD. She's brilliant. She has this background, I think, in like government, economics, all these things. You know, it'd be, if you want to pick her brain on what it's like to be in academia from her background, like write to her, give her some time as you're available, tell her like what you're asking for and what you're looking for. Um, that's a really good way to start. Let's talk about actually engaging your network both online and in person when the time comes. I want to talk about social media first, just because honestly, that's kind of what we have right now. You know, you, you, you can't just go to a mixer. Like when Jill and I are running MBA admissions at Ross, corporate recruiters would, would come to our, our main hall or they would, they would come to our, our school's lobby and they would just stand there and they'd have their sign and students could just come by, and introduce themselves and say, hey, I want to work at Procter & Gamble. Hey, I want to work at Tesla. We can't do that today, right? And, and I think that social media is going to give you an opportunity to stand up. And again, this can be um, on Instagram or Facebook um, or Google Jobs or LinkedIn. Um, maybe not so much Instagram. I, I don't see a whole lot of recruiters on, on Instagram, but some of the other platforms, I, I do see different professional groups. So uh, I'll just give you some tips for sharing and, and ways to stand out um, if you haven't seen these things already. Sharing a post, right? Uh, pretty basic, but it's tough to put yourself out there. Um, and, and I really would. It's just like as if you went up to somebody and you were shaking their hand and you're, you would say, hey, you know, I'm Sebastian. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Think about that same way in a post. The only thing to think about, though, is if you're posting on Facebook job group or if you're posting on a LinkedIn, don't get so caught up on like how many people see your post, how many people um, get a chance to read, how many people likes. Like, well, I'm not telling you to do this to encourage likes. I'm telling you this for you to get practice and for the one-off chance that someone who might care about the same thing you care about sees it too, right? Like I think about it, if you could just get out there and just reach one person or just help one other person, what you post can, can really be changing for somebody else. Uh, I'll give you some example of some of my posts um, and you can go from there. But again, I know I don't want you to think this to be like an Instagram, like, look at me, look at me, look at my posts and like me. But from a professional standpoint, there are things you can share that people will find valuable, right? It could be a presentation you've done. It could be a video of your work. Um, it could be posting about your learnings at a conference or at a um, an industry group. That stuff really matters. Another thing that people have been doing a lot on LinkedIn is asking for help on projects research. I know we get so tied in to, um, to what's going on specifically in your school or, or at your library or, or in your small little network. Um, not that you need to crowdsource your research, but I think as we get more academics and, and more professionals on LinkedIn that are sharing and posting content, it's a really great way to, to like get help. Like people are posting surveys, people are posting links to surveys, you can ask questions. Um, and that's all part of networking, right? Is, is asking other people for help. That's a really big step. I, I know there's a lot of pressure, um, depending on what your background is, to always get it right and to be perfect, but you don't have to be perfect. It's okay to ask for help and use social media and your platforms for that. Um, I, I put these two examples there. I know that it may not be ap applicable because um, I'm certainly not creating videos about my experience on LinkedIn. I mean, I've made occasional videos here and there, uh, but I'm not trying to be an influencer on, on YouTube. Um, but you know, if you got a cool science project that, that would warrant a video, by all means put it. Or if you're working in like design or, or UX UI and you want to put a video out there, that'd be fine. I think a really great opportunity for all of you here. And again, just start small. It doesn't have to be big. You don't have to worry about like a big audience right now. But it's a great opportunity for you as a professional to write a long form research article and put it on your LinkedIn. And then later on, put it on your CV or put it on your resume. Um, because when you start turning in CVs or resumes, you, you really should be hyperlinking a lot of um, your research and your LinkedIn profile. And I think um, having a long form research article or other papers on the platform that's already stored is actually a pretty easy way for you to share with other people. Not to mention, once you put these skills out there, it makes people easier to search for you. And I'll give you some like secrets on the search in a second. Um, but this is one of those things. When you post and when you share things, I would say don't try being someone you're not. Just 
share with what you want to know. Like, um, uh, what I shared right here, I'm not trying to humble brag. I just wanted to show you all. Um, I wrote something from the heart off the cuff one random morning and it went viral on LinkedIn. Um, I, I think there's a lot of influencers on our platform that like try to post every day. They talk about advice. They talk about, look at me, look at me. Um, but one morning I woke up and I was like, you know what? I'm a former recruiter and now recruiter and former admissions director. What can I tell people and students right now in the midst of 2020? And I wrote just a couple of paragraphs encouraging people and telling them it's going to be okay. Um, and it just really resonated with people, right? So don't, don't think your thoughts don't matter. Don't feel like you're unimportant because you never know what's going to appeal to people. I mean, if you can see at the bottom of the screen, my post got a million likes and, you know, 25,000 or a million views and 25,000 plus likes. My wife calls me like a, like an influencer now. And that's definitely not what I'm trying to be, but you just don't know what's going to resonate, especially now. Like everyone's searching for ways just to connect and learn more. So um, you can do, you can mention people's names, you know, just throw the at sign before you make a post hashtags. I think if you're on Instagram or, or Facebook, you know what, how hashtags work. It makes it easily searchable under, um, you know, specific call out specific subjects. And for me, I wanted students out there to know that it's going to be okay. Like don't pressure yourself too much. Give yourself a break. Like pressure is good, but you know, in this economy, in this recession, it's not easy. So, um, Fight back against that imposter syndrome the best you can. Like you deserve to be where you are today and you certainly can provide some contributions. So I really mean it. Just don't be afraid to make a post. Don't be afraid to reach out to somebody. Don't be afraid to, to, to be vulnerable and, and to share your thoughts and feelings and, and or areas of expertise. Um, it could really lead you somewhere. All right. Um, looking for opportunities. Uh, it's going to be a little bit hard. Uh, but I just want to give you a couple of sources, you know, once you start looking for jobs out there, whether it's online or, or offline, obviously each university or school has your, your own career center and your career development office. So obviously use those, get to know your career team, you know, get to know the program team, get to know the graduate life team. They're going to help you understand what recruiters are coming to campus and what jobs are available. Um, but I threw a few other lists here. Um, you know, Candor has a, a really interesting like uh, list of jobs that are open right now during this this economy. Um, if you go on LinkedIn, right on the right side of LinkedIn News, there's a, a bolded section of red that says the road ahead, or it has special report of like companies that are still hiring. And then Glassdoor, they also have lists of um, companies that are hiring as well. So depending on when you graduate, like I mean, I know you could be a PhD and and still have five years left to go, or you could just be a master's student with one year left to go to graduate. We get it, right? But just just keep an eye out to see what you want. If, if you do want to go into the private sector, there are some resources out there right now that have lists. Um, if you want to get academic jobs, I, I think all of you know, you know, some people will email department chairs um, ahead of time and just say, hey, do you have anything available? And then obviously there are also um, each of the university's own job boards that are, that are pretty important. Um, you can always dig into as well, but um, find that out there. In, in terms of, while we're talking about looking for jobs, just a quick side tip. A lot of people are skipping over the cover letter. Um, and I may be a little bit biased because, you know, being a former admissions director, I, I love essays and, and, and cover letters. Jill and I have some amazing stories about good and bad college admissions essays, but your cover letter can really provide a glimpse into who you are. So if you have an opportunity to write a cover letter, write a cover letter. Um, especially if you're making a career change, right? It, 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 your, your cover letter might only be three or four paragraphs, maybe three, but tell them why you want the role, why you'd be a good fit um, in the team and in the company. And also like talk to them about some of the skills you're bringing if you're a career changer, even if you're not. Um, it's a pretty low stakes opportunity to let that recruiter and let that hiring team know who you are. Um, so some companies don't need it. Like if you're applying to Google, they'll say, hey, your resume speaks for itself. No need. But if a company gives you that spot to add a cover letter, just really do it. Um, it's a little bit of an ask and it might go a long ways. Um, actually, while we're on the, the subject of, of applying to companies and, and, and resumes, there, there is a difference between your resume and your CV, right? Your CV is going to be the multi-form long document that could be two, three, four pages long that has all of your research 
all your presentations, um, everything that you've done, conferences you've attended. But if you are applying to the private sector in corporate America, your resume really should just be one page long. Um, and you, know, you can find different templates online, but the key to good resumes, um, take out the objective portion. Your objective is landing a job at that company. We're gonna really know. So save yourself the real estate. If you're working on a resume, the one pager really should be your name, contact information, since you're coming out of school, have your education up there, um, date of graduation, degree, specialty, um, and then your, your job and work experience. Stay away from job descriptions. Most recruiters and hiring teams will know what a particular job does. It's more important to talk about your accomplishments and the numbers and data behind any projects or work that you've done. Um, if, if you want to Google it, go to Google and, and look up like the Google XYZ resume format. That just means um, all your bullet points should be in XYZ as in you did X or you accomplished X by doing Y as measured by Z, right? So um, again, if you want some detail on that, just hop on Google, it'll teach you how to, to do all those things. But your resume, stay away from job descriptions, add as much numbers and data as possible. I would probably say um, three to four bullet points per job, depending how long your career is, but just the most important highlights it is gonna be really valuable. Um, and a small aside, just make sure your resume matches with your LinkedIn. Uh, some people will embellish one or the other, or they don't get their facts straight. And if recruiters will ask about it, that you want to make sure that that you're, you know, you're performing with integrity and doing the right thing, um, and that both both matches across your CV and resume. All right. So, a little quick aside there from a recruiter to all of you. If you start doing that, um, keep that in mind. Another thing you can do on on LinkedIn, um, and I think if you have a Glassdoor profile, you can do this in Glassdoor as well, um, is show that you're open to the network that you want to look for jobs. So. On LinkedIn, underneath your name, there's a little box that says you can click it, check it, and say you're open to work or open to opportunities. And it's as simple as that. Um, it helps recruiters find you easier. Um, just like Glassdoor or Indeed or LinkedIn, most people's profiles, every single piece of text is searchable. So if any of you are in you know, web development, just think of it as like SEO, like search engine optimization. Any single piece or information you put on your profile will be searchable to recruiters and to people that are gonna hire you. So if you say, yes, I'm open to job opportunities and I need someone with this area of expertise, if you put on your profile, the algorithms will make it easier for them to find you. So keep that in mind. Um, if you're looking for jobs, make it pretty apparent. Another thing, I don't wanna scare y'all when it comes to like job searching and, and networking for opportunity right now, but every job gets so many more applications than we have room for. So it's really important when you're on those job platforms or you're on networking platforms to really set job alerts. Um, because if you know what you're going to do, you know, find that company, find that role and, and really begin to list yourself now. So you get that heads up, um, not to scare you, but just for an example, at LinkedIn, our software engineering internship application, got about 30,000 applications for maybe 275 internships. So, I mean, if you're in that first few thousand, we're probably gonna have a chance to review you. Um, but if you're late to it and you post towards the end, you may not necessarily get a chance. Now, depending on each company's HR policy, you know, they may randomize the process. Um, they may just say first come, first serve, but it never hurts to be among the first group. So absolutely, like, in your network, tell people, this is what I want to do. If you hear of an opening, please let me know. Just like you would set up a job alert on any of the other job platforms, whether it's Google Jobs um, or on LinkedIn or even with company websites, right? If you go on to um, a, a Tesla or even a university job board, you can actually like pre-select job searches. So really, really do that. Uh, referrals, I think referrals can be an important piece of anyone's job search. And this is really where that idea of networking, connecting with people um, really play. Because people, we don't want to close off any networks, right? Like some people don't have a referral or an in, um, but it usually can't hurt you. If you ask for a referral, this is where I mean recruiting and, and networking is a long game. 
make sure you're not reaching out to a person you haven't reached out to in five years by saying, hey, Christine, I haven't talked to you since college, but I need a job. Try to stay in touch with people a little bit more often than that. What, that way, when you ask for a referral, they can help you out. Because one note about a referral is when you ask people to, to put in a good word for you at, at their company, most internal HR teams are going to ask that employee, how do you know Sarah? How do you know Sean? How do you know Eric? And can you tell us if they'd be among the top 10% of people that you know, and would they meet basic qualifications for this job? But just a minor thing that, that people will have to jump through some hoops for you. So if you're going to ask them, help them out. All right. So that was a lot of just back end, you know, online stuff. I, I just want to talk about some quick tips, what it's like when you're connecting with people again in person, um, whenever the day happens to be. I think the first thing that I tell people is, is to own personal story before you can go out there and, and be comfortable, like shaking hands and kissing babies. You have to be comfortable with your own personal story and, and really be open to growing. Um, you know, a story that I always tell is about my first generation background. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, my parents were both refugees, but to cut a little bit deeper into that story, both my parents work like hourly labor jobs. My dad cut fish at a seafood processing plant. My, my, my mom worked at McDonald's, like cleaning tables. Like she wasn't even advanced enough to where she could work behind the counter and take orders. She like cleaned tables and took out the garbage. Like that's, that's hard, right? Like most people in tech and, and have gone to the schools that I've gone, don't come from backgrounds like that. And so whatever your background is from, like, you know, don't be afraid to share Like, okay, big deal. Maybe you come from the opposite ma background, right? Maybe both your parents are PhDs or maybe both your parents are lawyers. That's okay too, right? Like there are things that you could talk about with that story. You could say, you know what? Both my parents are lawyers and I knew I didn't want to be that. Um, and so I went into um, corporate real estate. Or it could be, you know, both my parents were physicians, so I knew I didn't want to do that. So I wanted to go into um, software engineering and mobile application development. But again, really do your best to formulate your, your elevator pitch. And again, I, I always think that's something that's about 30 to 60 seconds, just an idea of who you are, what you're like, and what you want to do. But um, just know where you're coming from, and, and, and that's going to help you go a long way. Again, don't be afraid to share who you are. Okay, now that that's out of the way, when it comes to networking, just, just play the game. I, I know that it could be uncomfortable, but just at least get out there and try. Um, there's this old Chinese proverb where it's, uh, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Same way goes for networking. Um, it may be uncomfortable at first, it may never be comfortable, but you have to at least try. Um, just because we can't get anywhere in the world alone, um, especially with the you know proliferation of information, um, just try, all right? So whatever you do, if you get anything from this day, just think about putting your pants on one leg at a time, you know, throwing that jacket on, lacing up your shoes and going to that event, going to that career fair. Um, at least get out there when you can, all right? Couple of quick tips as I hit off before we uh, kind of pause for general questions here. Body language really matters. Now this translates in person, this translates, um, you know, whether that back to career fairs or in-person interaction. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, I mean, I mean eye contact. I know eye contact is, is different among various cultures, um, but you know, look ahead if you can and, and, and do your best. Like it's, it's not good to be looking at the ground when you're interacting with somebody. It's not good to be looking away from them. Like be in the moment. Um, and another minor thing, I'm not sure we're going to go back to this, but in case you do, the power of a decent handshake, I, I think still plays, right? By that, Google it. Like just don't give people a floppy fish handshake. Um, you know, or, or watch your palms. I, I think just the way you, you greet and interact with people is really, really important. You know, what it, it means to stand as confidently as you can. Um, it, it means to really be present in the moment. Like, it does matter. And even, even on camera, right? So I know we're talking about in person, but like any chance you get to see what you look like on camera nowadays, take advantage of it. I know that we don't all have great offices or backdrops. Like my backdrop here 
it's it's real. It's bookshelves that I all got from IKEA. Um, but you know, whether it's just a background um, or a wall, it doesn't matter. Just pay attention to your lighting and 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 how you dress and how you appear. Um, I will say that um, also included body language is 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 dress code. Um, different industries dress differently, so just pay attention to that beforehand. Um, I know in tech, everyone's kind of in that jeans and slacks polo t-shirt type deal you don't have to wear a suit uh, but in academia you probably have to get a little bit more dressed up so just pay attention beforehand um, another key in in in-person networking i would say is just your ability to listen when you are networking with somebody one-on-one -on -one or you know in a classroom setting or anywhere else there's a lot of pressure on people to get out what you want to get out so people sometimes will will listen just so they can have their turn to speak. And I don't want you to approach it that way. The best way to, to listen is truly listen to hear what the other person has to say, ask them good and valuable questions, and then and then repeat some of that back and, and find that common ground. Like, don't be so focused on what you're going to say that you don't actually listen to what that other person says, because it's, it's going to eventually come back and get you. Like, if you come in and are like, oh, I want to tell this recruiter all these things, great things about me, but you blanked when they told you what they're looking for or some areas of what they can connect with you, that's gonna be a pretty big miss in your part. Building on that, do your research. I mentioned this earlier, but you know when it comes to understanding the person's company or, or cultural background or norms, it's, it's really important. Um, you know, in, in my last few jobs, I've done a lot of international travel. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the United States um, you know, people see me, see my Asian name and, and see my Asian appearance and just assume, you know, that I may not be like all American from Seattle area, Washington. Um, but when I traveled to Asia, I had to learn all those cultural norms, right? I had, I had to learn the proper opportunity of when to bow. I had to learn the etiquette for handshakes. I had to learn the etiquette to how to receive people's business cards, right? In the United States, you hand someone a business card, you just give it to them one hand at a time. But when you're in Japan or Korea, you take gifts and you take business cards with both hands, you examine the card, and then you put it in a nice place. You don't just stick it in your back pocket, right? So there are cultural norms. Just look ahead. It's just like the, the double kiss cheek in, in Europe, right? Like just know when to do things. It's a simple thing, but it goes a long way. Like I've, I've seen that um, when I'm talking to professionals in different parts of the world or different cultural norms, it's always helpful to understand what you're getting to ahead of time. Um, just don't think your way is the right way, right? Like I could, I could have busted into those places in all over Asia and Europe as like this American cowboy, um, but I didn't. You know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for respecting people's business norms and cultural norms. So, so do your best. Another part of networking, um, and I, I love this saying too. Um, you know, if, if you're at a career fair and you're in a circle, like. Maybe it doesn't need to be said, but you know, don't cut other people off. Don't get in their way. Um, I, I think it's just so important. I, I know that you have to fight for what you want, but it's really important to be proper and polite about it. You know, there is, you know, there are common courtesies to keep in mind. Um, so don't get so focused on yourself that you walk all over other people. A um, couple other things I want to just really point out that are important. Um, be intentional. I meant this earlier. I, I said the help us help you. Like always have purpose behind what you're doing so you're not wasting your time. You're not wasting other people's time. If you call someone and say, hey, let's meet for coffee, shoot them an agenda ahead of time. Let them know what they're going to do for you. If you want someone to like, write you a recommendation, give them a few bullet points about what you're, what you're good at. You know, send them your CV or resume so they can help you out. Um, I just think it's really important that that you you do your best, not waste your time or other people's time. Um, last thing, read the room. It's 2020. There are there are so many things for us to be aware of now in in terms of of what's appropriate and what's not. Um, I, I really want you all. And this is not me trying to be the PC police. This is not me trying to tell people to to be political or not political. Um, but just because something was okay a couple years ago does not mean it's okay nowadays. So, so do your best you can to like learn from people and understand where they're coming from. Um, whether it comes to humor, um, whether it comes to like 
you know, jokes about anything. Um, you know, I think we're getting better as a society to, to, to help people feel I- included. And I think it's really important when you're out there networking and connecting with people. Um, so, so do your best there. Another part of rooting the room is professionalism. There is a certain sense of professional decorum that I, I think is still there when you're interacting with people outside your friend group. Um, I don't want to make myself feel old here, but there's this great romantic comedy called Hitch. Um, Will Smith, Kevin James, it's about a date doctor. And I always tell people this when it comes to professionalism. There's this great scene where Will Smith is teaching Kevin James how, how to kiss, right? They're on this porch. And the whole idea of the kiss is one person goes 90 and the other person goes 10. You don't you don't have to go 100% all of you, right? I think same goes with connecting and recruiting. Like there is like that sense of professionalism and decorum and, and authenticity um, people say all the time, like, be authentically you, bring my whole self to work. I agree with that. But I think about 90% of yourself is the right way to go. You know, there are still, still some areas that you don't need to bring with you, some areas that are, you know, not necessary. Um, but yeah, you go 90, they go 10. Easy way to think about it. Um, and if you haven't watched Hitch yet, great, great show, great show. Um, last thing here before I open up for general questions and, you know, ask me anything you want. I have to remind you all to, to consider networking is a long game. You know, it's not just a, a buy one, get one. You know, it's it's a kind of throw a little bit here, throw a little bit there. It's a give and take, and it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, be prepared. You know, be ready so you don't have to get ready. Like, that that means, like, doing your research, getting ahead of time, knowing how you want to approach things. Um, I think you should bet on yourself. You know, you've gotten this far. You know, if you think about the context of the world, right, when, when you all get out of school, you are going to be so well equipped with your background, with your degrees, with your areas of study and, and where they're needed in society and in business these days. That, like, believe in yourself, know that you belong there, know that you have a lot to offer um, and don't be afraid to share. Last thing is keep learning. Um, I turned 40 uh, last month and I'm not a finished product. You know, like I just started to feel like like I finally had it, you know, like I, and, and I have many, many more decades to work. So enjoy the journey. Like it, there's a long build on the way up um, and don't get so caught up in like success as a destination. Um, I think if you look at it along the way and, and just keep on building and adding your skill set and toolkit, you'll, you'll be much better off. So um, with that said, I, I want to just open up for general questions. Um, I don't know if Jill, you want to just have people unmute themselves and ask questions. So you want them to raise hands, what, whatever you want to do, I'm, I'm open to. I'm going to pop the, off my sharing here. Absolutely. I would encourage all of you to share your screens so that we can see faces and maybe change your view from the presenter view to the, to the big grid that we, we've become so familiar with. Um, and uh, maybe just physically raise your hand if you have a question. I think that or that you want to address. I think that's worked pretty well in other sessions. Um, and there were also a few questions in the chat while you were speaking, son. All right, so, cool. You can also feel free to chat your questions in if you're more comfortable with that. Though I hope Sun has just inspired you to put yourself out there and and come up with the best body language you can and sit up straight and practice asking your questions. All right. Um, I could warm this up. I could just you know, unless someone wants to go real quick, I could just start reading out some questions and see if I got any. Uh, any I saw answers. Destiny raise his or her hand. I I did. Of course. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I should unmute myself and start speaking or just raise my hand. Um, so I have a question. Um, so kind of about like owning your background. Uh, I come from working class family and I spent multiple, multiple years working fast food. And this is something I've gone back and forth with about including on like my CV, my CV and my resume as well as on my LinkedIn profile. Um, because, you know, I think that it shows that I, am able to commit to a job. I worked for eight years from mm-hmm. like 16 on um, until I moved out of state. And I was wondering what your opinion was on including something like that in, you know, that profile setting, because that is not what I do anymore. I'm a hydrologist now and, you know, it's completely different, but 
I felt like it kind of showed that I'm willing to work and stick into a job. Mm -hmm. But I was, what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think when, when you're working in, in fast food, um, you know, my first job in, in high school was Little Caesars Pizza. Um, so I get it, right? I, I understand there's the complexity that there's like customer service, there's work ethic, there's the consistent approach, there's like learning, you know, how to do things with not just like your mind, but with your hand. There's importance to that. I would say when it comes to some of that earlier career fast food work, probably anything after high school, I, I, I would actually you know, I wouldn't be afraid to put in at the bottom of your profile. Um, and especially when you're able to explain your role a little bit more. I mean, I, I think, you know, you probably don't have to go into super detail about it, but I think it is a, a, a worthy thing to put on there. Um, and especially you said you did it for eight years. So, um, yeah, I think some people might, might wonder, like they might, they might go, oh, well, you know, what what has Destiny been doing? Like, where's this gap from? But I think after high school, probably okay to put put some of that experience there. Cool. Uh, Sarah, I think. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. So I have a follow-up question on that. Um, my situation is uh, kind of similar in a sense that I have been working in multiple positions at the time. So it, when I try to create a timeline, it looks kind of messy. To me, all of that work that I've done contributes to where I am and what I learned, but it's a little tricky to decide what to include and what not. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, I hear feedback like, oh, I wish I knew that you have done this as well. This is helpful. And some other times I hear like, oh, this is not relevant. You have been doing too many different stuff. It's a little challenging to figure out how to manage that. I would appreciate your advice. Yep, I think there's two approaches here say one is kind of like your your LinkedIn online approach and then one would be like your CV resume approach so that extra work that you were doing was it with multiple companies like were you kind of like a contractor or were you kind of like a consultant with taking on different projects or were you just doing multiple projects for one company so for example back home before grad school I had a part-time teaching job mm -hmm. as well as full-time tech job and then I had my hobby of working as a certified tour guide, mm -hmm. which, uh, and these all contribute to my current position as a UX researcher. I've learned points in all those positions that are relevant, mm -hmm. but I don't know which one to include because they seem all over the place. So what I would do is, so on, on your LinkedIn profile, I would probably, I probably list all those things. Um, now, if it doesn't look clean from like a, a data format and from a, a chronological format, you could probably play around with that. Like if you absolutely needed to, you could just put, um, you could put them in like a project. Like you can say like, you take two things and put them on your actual work experience and you go to a lower area and actually list them as like special projects that you've done. Like that could be a way to make it look cleaner. On your CV or resume, on your CV, if you were gonna turn in a full CV, like you probably wanna put it all on. For a resume, job by job, you probably have to pick and choose which of those things are relevant and, and, and maybe just put one or two bullet points on each. Um, just because, you know, if you're looking at UI UX stuff, like they're probably going to be demanding less things and they might say, Hey, we get how this affects your, your point of view, mm -hmm. but how it relates to the job description and basic and preferred qualifications, it might not fit in there. So I, I would read every single job description. And if there are some things that were relatable, Put those in but i would probably tone things down for the resume but on the linkedin throw everything on there okay makes sense thank you yep so there's a question in the chat yep from earlier that says on linkedin there are a lot of skills that can be listed are there certain ones that we should be using to make our profiles more robust slash get more views ah uh, uh not in terms of a specific skill I would say that if um, the most important thing is to have your skills match up with your bullet point jobs, experience, and research, right? Because it, it kind of doubles down on that. So let's say when someone goes and tries to find you on LinkedIn, they're going to type in a certain set of skills, a certain set of education, and maybe like a, a an amount of experience or a graduation date. The more times that shows up, the more likely it's going to show up in a search. It's essentially search engine optimization. Um, I think the difference is that 
most of you, if not all of you, are, are in very specific science STEM things. So I, I think you have an opportunity to put some great hard skills on there. So if it's programming languages, absolutely get your programming languages on there. If it's like research and heavy things, like put those things on there. The soft skill stuff, I really wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, I, I definitely put our technical skills on though. All right. Um, anybody else? And I'll go through the chat in a second. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for. Okay. Can I go home? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, so thank you so much for the beautiful presentation. It's a um, high opening experience for me. And um, I have um, two questions. So the first one is regarding um, some closed group on LinkedIn. For example, the clinical specialties are closed groups, most of most often than not. You either are uh, within the profession before you can gain access, although there are a few that um, you can only read messages, and but it's literally guarded. You don't have access. So when you have those kind of challenges, for example, I'm interested in clinical positions, um, what clinical professions and the positions also that are attached to them. So. How do I navigate that through LinkedIn? Yes, I, I found that like my best with the closed groups, I, I don't have as much experience with closed groups. So um, you, I might have to look in this a little bit for you, but with closed groups, I typically tend to find um, like a hashtag around it or like the group name. And I've done some searches based off of the group name or based off of like the administrator. Um, and once I find them, um, I'll just kind of keep an eye on who they are and, and follow the same things they follow or make a comment on something that they've commented on. It's kind of the same way. Like if you, if you know the job you want, you search for that title on LinkedIn and you kind of just slowly, I mean, it's, you know, I LinkedIn, I don't want to call it stalking, but I mean, it's just a polite way to follow somebody. Like you just kind of keep an eye on like what's most important to them. That's the same way with these closed groups, right? Like you kind of get into that, you understand what that area is and you, you just get to that ecosystem and, and start like looking up those hashtags and those relevant people more. Um, and as you try to interact with them, you kind of slowly work your warm intro lead right there instead of just trying to like, Hey, I'm interested in this group. Can I get in right away? They're going to be like, Hey, who are you? Um, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. And my second question is an offshoot from that. So um, now, in um, I I send message introductory messages to people on LinkedIn informing interested in your work, and I'd love to have a discussion. So, but um, is there an an acceptable algorithm of duration of follow up after you send an initial message? Maybe two weeks, three weeks, no response. Is it appropriate to send another one or just, or that is telling you no, no? I, I think a follow-up is, is always great. Um, an additional follow-up, like I need the additional follow-ups. Um, like people will, will write me a message and I'll just kind of glance through it really and be, oh, great, I'll respond to them when I can. And the reality matters is that as professionals, there's more, there's less time than we have, right? So if like in a week or two, someone falls up and it's like just saying, hey, um, you know, just really politely again, I just love to hear a little bit more about what you're doing or just want to reintroduce myself um, and then make that ask, you know, just be like, hey, if you have a, you know, I'd really love to talk to you about this specific project or I've seen this specific thing, um, reference that, you know, it's, but yeah, I, I think two is always okay and like, Maybe a third follow-up, but I, that's probably at that point, like, you know, they'll find you when they find you. It's, um, yeah, but probably one or two is always okay in my book for follow-ups. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. What else we got? Uh, hi, Sam. My name is Maria. I wanted to ask about, <clears throat> especially when you're still a student and don't have a lot of professional experience, it can be tricky to reach out because you don't want to come off as needy, right? You want to sort of offer something to make that a, a working relationship, but you might not have a lot to offer. So uh, like in my case, I, I do work uh, full time too as a student. Um, I'm a bilingual data consultant at Wells Fargo. So I lead with that so that people don't think I'm connecting 
um, you know, because I have a hidden interest. I'm like, you know, I have a job. I just want to know more about you. But I remember a time when I was an undergrad and it's sort of awkward because you don't want it to seem so transactional. But I mean, maybe leading with um, like an informational interview or I'm interested in your stuff. Like how, how might you go about that when you don't have a lot to offer yourself? Well, I would say one is just to be as specific as possible. Like if, if there is that ask for an informational interview, you have to really dig in deep and say, hey, I saw some of these really cool programs at your company, like, you know, whether it's at Wells Fargo or at a JP Morgan Chase or, or you know, whatever you want to do, just be like, hey, I, I saw that you did this diversity program in the community. Um, I would love to be part of that someday. You know, would you be willing to share some tips and tricks? Or um, I saw this you know, young leadership program that your company has started. And I want to do that too at, at, for, for my, you know, for my company, would you be willing to help us with that? Um, so I would say like, take it one more level deep beyond like, Hey, I'm so-and-so, this is my background. I'd love to connect. But like, if you can find like that one or two things, um, would be great. It's just like, for me, um, people always talk about campus recruiting, but when they start mentioning things like first generation background, or if they talk about like, immigrant parents or if they talk about Notre Dame football, I'm usually gonna be pretty hooked, you know. So any little thing counts. Um I saw a question on the chat a second ago about um career gaps for parenting, for traveling, um, or otherwise. I am of the school where you 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 list what you did in that in that job gap. Um, because people are very understanding these days, sabbaticals, they're very understanding of time off as parents. A lot of companies even have programs for like return to work for parents these days. So it's always better to tell us what you're doing during that time. Like even if you were just traveling the world on a sabbatical, you could always tell us what you learned and all the new cultures you brought in, right? And if you spent that time raising two kids, more power to you, right? Like they're, they're like most companies like have groups for parents to like, share best practices and just like to to be together and, and that's a valued thing um so don't you know don't shy away from that you know if there is a gap of i'd say anything longer than like nine months to a year just tell us what you were doing no one's going to judge you for it okay um what else i'll go through the chat here too if someone else wants to pop a question in there Diana, did you have a question a few minutes ago? I did have a question. Um, but the gentleman who spoke a little while soon actually kind of addressed it. But I will say hi, son. Um, I really appreciate your talk. And when you talked about your experience as the son of refugees, that really resonates with me um, because I'm the same. Um, I, I guess what I've been thinking about over the course of your presentation is that I'm it's almost serendipitous that you're giving this talk because I'm attending a virtual conference right now. And so all I've been doing is trying to network. And I found that these virtual platforms make it so much easier to get that one on one engagement. And so I guess more of my question that um, Olawson kind of asked is that, you know, when you're not in these settings where people are being open to just sort of networking and connecting with you, like if you were to say, do like a sort of cold call someone um i guess there is no there's no loss in asking but you've already talked a little bit about how we can more more appropriately coax the response back um, yeah i will say the thing about cold calls and you know i recruit sales trainees so i get it right when you're you're, you're chasing leads you're you're developing sales talent um and this is I don't want this to sound to go against the transactional nature of what I spoke up before, but with cold calls, you can't get to everybody, right? Like when you're on LinkedIn, there are just so many people out there that have great skills and skill sets that are willing to help you out. Um, don't feel like it's your one shot only. Like if, if someone is just not available to get to you, on to the next one. Someone's going to like, eventually someone's going to say yes, and that's all you need. Um, so give them a follow up. If you don't, if they don't get it, it's their loss. I mean, I know there are so many people that have reached out to me. That I haven't been able to get to, and that's that's my that's a bad on me, right? I just I, I can't get to everybody. Like they're gonna land somewhere else, awesome, and they're gonna contribute to their company and do amazing things. It's just like when Jill and I were in, in, in missions, right? A lot of most people that apply could do the work, 
You know, a lot of people applied could have been very successful students at Ross's MBA program. We just couldn't take everybody and they're going to end up good somewhere else too. And that's the same way with like cold calling on people and reaching out. Like everyone's going to find someone at some point. So just don't get too discouraged. Thank you. All right. Let's see if we have Looks like Sarah has her hand up. I think you're muted, Sarah. <laughs> okay. While we're waiting for Sarah, I will mention that tomorrow's Accelerate to Industry talk that we are conducting on the platform called Hopin has a networking feature. So at the end of the presentation, after the Q&A like this, there will be an opportunity to do networking and the artificial intelligence of that platform matches you with people and you get three minutes to talk, kind of like speed dating. And if you find you both want to connect, you can click uh, exchange contact information. So it's a good place to practice some of the things Sun is giving you advice on today. Yeah, one of the quick things about career fairs um, is a lot of people, I was just in an online career fair on Friday and people will just, you know, ping me on the virtual platform and say, hey, what opportunities do you have at LinkedIn? I really would push you to, if you've done your research and just say, hey, you know, I'm Maria, I'm Andrew, I saw this opportunity, you know, are you the right person I can ask some questions about so-and-so? That will just put you in the good graces of most recruiters and most volunteers that that's always a good first step. Cool. Yeah. Sarah, do you have another? Or who? Yes. Yeah. yes, I have another question, please. Uh, and thank you, Jill, for sharing about this uh, networking opportunity tomorrow. It sounds cool. So um, my next question is, um, a lot of us are in grad school. We have some work experience before grad school, and then we are graduating with a graduation date some time later than this point. There are positions requiring work experience. They're not necessarily master or PhD level, but a lot of times uh, when we apply online, they calculate our experience based on our latest graduation date, and that can become frustrating. So I was wondering if you have a workaround for that, because I have like 10 plus years of experience before grad school, but now when I look at job positions, uh, they just look at uh, my graduation coming in December 2020, and that's it. Um, and that's challenging. Um, well, I think it depends on the type of jobs you're applying for, right? So um, in your shoes and in anybody else's shoes that has work experience, there's kind of a couple avenues into any company. They have their campus hiring pipeline, and then they have like their more experienced recruiting pipeline. So the experienced recruiting pipeline has like their own job requirements in terms of basic qualifications and preferred qualifications. And the campus guidelines just says, as long as you meet whatever this that job posting says, and you're graduating with this amount of time frame, that's what you're applying for. So I would say, Sarah, it, it really depends on if you're applying to the campus portal or if you're applying to like the more experienced portal. The more experienced portal, they really should be looking past the graduation date. The only issue that comes up, which I think is probably a bigger deal than your graduation date, the experienced portal needs people in real time, like within the next few weeks, and that's probably where they're getting scared off by the graduation date. If you're applying for a campus portal job, those jobs are gonna be held open for like six to nine months. So that's usually when they'll disregard dates. If you run into any bottlenecks because of dates, it's probably because those roles need somebody in seat right now. So if you're doing like a part-time program or if you actually can work now, you need to uh, write that out uh, in terms of your availability, either in your cover letter or even in like your, your resume and, and just put like a little asterisk and say like, you know, available to work right now, but, you know, graduation is expected in December 2020 or December 2021. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to do it. I know that's not the cleanest answer, but um, some companies just use an AI to look over resumes and some companies will have a person look at it. Um, and right. that's just unpredictable. Right. Thank you. I, I like the advice. I'll try the asterisk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
cool. Um, any other things that popped up? Did you see any other big themes there, Jill, about um, questions otherwise? There was a question earlier in the chat about whether it's appropriate to keep up, maintain contact with faculty members who had written your recommendation to get into grad school. I mean, I think that's good to your heart. It's a good idea in general, not just for like networking professionalism. You know, I think you, you remember the people that help get you where you are. Um, I mean, I still stay in touch with my undergrad college professors. Actually, I still keep in touch with my high school professors, uh, high school teachers. So I think, you know, people teach and people are, are in higher education for a reason. So keep them updated about your successes, right? They might ask you to come back and pay it forward someday. Like they might say, hey, you know, it was great having you in class. I love writing you a rec letter recommendation. You want to come back and speak at the class someday? That's a great opportunity. It might be fun too. So yeah, definitely. I think that applies to directors of centers for graduate life too. <laughs> they probably would love to hear how you're doing when you're alumni and would love to have you back to run panels for current students. Yeah, I'd, I'd also want to jump in um, really quickly and just to say that the job that I have now, I was found through LinkedIn and I wasn't, I didn't even apply. I didn't look for it. I mean, I'm, I was a student, so I wasn't looking for anything full time, but the opportunity to present itself. So I would encourage everyone to just like be patient um, and like be genuine and authentic in what you're doing and just know that like uh, Sun said, there's somebody that's going to find and identify your skills and to his, the point that you just made. Um, a position opened up and they asked me, you know, do you know anybody? And I immediately thought of a classmate that I worked on a project on in class. So, and, and she's going through interviews right now. So you never know, um, definitely keep those doors open. Ah, it's so great to know that the platform works. Well, it is 5.30, uh, so uh, we are about out of time, but Sun, I'd like to really thank you for joining us today and talking with our students. And thanks to all of you for taking this time. I know that it is tough out there right now to get on one more WebEx or one more Zoom call. Uh, and I'm glad that you made the commitment to do that. Uh, it's really vital, as, as Sun just mentioned, to keep learning, keep growing right now and get ready so you'll be ready. And that's absolutely what you're doing by joining us today. So thanks to everyone, and I hope I will see you tomorrow and next week. Take care, all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.